subspecies of native birds, so this includes indigenous and endemic, is about 128, and then there are, that includes um, fossils. So the reason I say about 128 um, and about 57 fossils is that we're discovering new species of birds uh, in um, archaeological sites, in places like the Ebble Plain, in uh, sinkholes, and I just got a call from someone last week who thinks that she may have found a new large flightless goose and a new long-legged owl. So that number is going to keep changing, so it probably shouldn't be on the test. Um, endemic extant, birds that are still around, about 30. Um, and I actually, I think the number's higher than that. Let's see. Endemic but historically extinct, meaning the birds went extinct after people what I'm going to call continental people got here. So people from Europe, people from uh, Asia, excluding Polynesians, which we think came from some part of Asia. And then endemic birds that are known only as fossils or subfossils, because they haven't had enough time to turn to rock yet, uh, about 57 species. Indigenous breeders, these are mostly seabirds and a couple of water birds, 25 species. And then visitors, you know, they, these come along with the tourists, so they like to come in the winter, you know, when it's warm. Uh, we have regular visitors, about 42. And then stragglers or accidentals, birds that we don't see very often. They're sort of, oh gosh, we've never seen that before, but, but we make a record of it. There have been as many as 82 recorded. Uh, breeding species that are not native, 41. And then we have a variety of escaped cage birds that haven't established uh, long breeding populations yet, but some of them are well on their way to doing that. Okay, um, total extant native breeders. So now this includes indigenous and endemic, not the same as the number uh, 30. 22 seabirds, 5 water birds, and about 37 land birds. The total number of alien breeding species is about 41. And so the total number of birds we have that breeds here is about 103. So where did our native birds come from? They came from the New World and the Old World. And this is an ancient map that was found in one of the first, uh, or the first edition of the uh, Atlas of Hawaii. So our crow, gallinules, and waterbirds, hawk, heron, um, owls, stilt, Hawaiian thrushes, and the uh, colea or golden plover all from the New World. Uh, honey creepers, probably New World, maybe, maybe not. And then uh, the Miller bird, which I'm going to talk to you about at the very end, the elopio, our native flycatcher. And then our native birds that we used to think were honey, honey eaters, but <clears throat> they're now uh, thought to be in a different family from honey eaters. And if you know birds well enough, you care about that. If you don't, that's fine. So bird families with indigenous breeders. So these, the indigenous species are made up primarily of seabirds. We have three species of albatrosses that breed here. Um, and we have six species of petrels and shearwaters that breed here. Um, storm petrels, which are my favorite kind of seabirds, they're little things, some of them smaller than minor birds. Um, two species. Tropic birds, we have two, and there are only three species of tropic birds in the world. And we have that third species kind of hanging around, and we hope maybe it might uh, decide to start breeding here. Three species of boobies, and uh, these are boobies right here. Um, one species of frigate bird, one species of heron, 
and then six species of terns and noddies. And this little uh, bird is a white tern chick. And white terns breed on the Manoa campus. And once you watch them a little bit, they're, they're very easy to distinguish from the white pigeons. And you can find them in all sorts of places and trees. So these are our two most common albatrosses. And uh, if you go on the Kaena Point field trip, which I presume you are going to take at some point, you'll see these birds out there. They're breeding now. The chicks have hatched. They're cute and fluffy. They're going to get kind of tall and awkward pretty soon. These birds breed only in the northwestern uh, Hawaiian Islands. And so we actually, there is a black-footed albatross that's hanging around at Kaena Point right now. So if you want to zip out there right after class, you might be able to see it. And then this bird, which is just a lovely bird, called the golden goonie by some people because in their adult plumage they have this beautiful golden head. This is the short-tailed albatross, which now has a world population of maybe 500 birds, but not very long ago it was only a couple of hundred birds. And the first successful breeding that we know of in Hawaii occurred on Midway in 2012. And the chick survived that tsunami. It's unbelievable. It was washed about 40 feet away from the nest site. Somebody coaxed it onto a garbage bag and dragged it back to the nest site, and it did fledge. This is what the birds look like before they reach fully adult plumage. And this young lady was on uh, Midway in 1996, and she laid an egg, and there was some guy you know, at the dump a couple hundred feet away but they never got together. They're very true to the, the site that they choose to breed. Okay, some of the petrels include the Bonin petrel, which we don't see in the main Hawaiian Islands at all. Big population on Midway. Um, the Harcourt storm petrel, this bird is endemic to the Hawaiian Islands. We have never found a nest of the Harcourt storm petrel, and I'm determined to do that once I get to the big island. They nest at high altitudes on Mauna Loa. And Mauna is a really big mountain, so it's going to take quite a while to find them. But we know that they breed here because you can see some down on this bird. So this is a young of the year. This is a chick. So that's how we know they breed. These little guys are uh, bone and petrels, and they breed on our offshore islands and occasionally in rocky cliffs on the main, Hawaii, on the main islands. But it's difficult for seabirds to breed on the main islands because they're very susceptible to predation by rats cats, dogs, and uh, careless people. We have three species of boobies. The uh, masked booby. Who was that masked booby, you might ask? The, uh, the brown booby. And this, this is a big brown booby baby, in case you haven't figured that out. And here is a red-footed booby right here. And the red-foots are the only ones that build a nest. The other two nest on the ground. And if you're close to a nest of the masked boobies, you don't want to back up into them because the parents will stab you in the leg to keep you away from their child. This is a female of the great frigate bird here, uh, about to land on its nest and feed its chick. And I put in a few uh, sort of cultural notes here in this talk. Uh, there were a number of uh, Hawaiian artifacts that were, feather artifacts that were made using the feathers from Eva. And the feathers that were used were only on the back of the neck of males, and they were only collected during the breeding season, because that's when those feathers are very bright. Um, and that's an example of a kahili that's made with frigate bird feathers. This is an immature red-tailed tropic bird, and the feathers of uh, immature birds were used, as well as the flank feathers of adults, and I'll show you a picture of an adult in a bit. This is a pre-contact kahili, and these are all flank feathers from red-tailed tropic birds. And there are some uh, frigate bird or eva feathers at the base of that kahili. So here's more red-tailed tropic bird feathers. And here's that long red tail. You can't, in either of these photographs, see the flank feathers that are used in uh, that previous kahili. But you can certainly see the tail feathers on this kahili. And sometimes those tail feathers were split in half. And they're, they're about an eighth of an inch wide at the tip. So how people did that is, is a mystery to me, but they were able to do that. Here are some of the terns and noddies. Brown noddies, which breed on banana or rabbit island. Grayback terns only nest off of um, Kilauea Point on Kauai, but we can see them if we go there. 
Black knotties have a few nesting colonies in the main islands, and then sooty terns nest on a number of offshore islands, most notably Manana. There are a lot of sooties and a lot of brown knotties on Manana Island. Okay, regular migrants. So these are birds that come and spend the winter here and go elsewhere, usually to Alaska, northern Canada, sometimes to Siberia to breed. Uh, and this is, the, I just love this bird. It's a very pretty bird, and I've been to Alaska to study it. Uh, where it breeds 40 miles north of Nome, and there was a bird that was banded up there that shows up during the winter in San Francisco. So, of course, we call it Frisco. Uh, and then this is a black-bellied plover. Um, storm petrels winter here, some ducks and geese do, other species of plovers, and then we have sandpipers and curlews and godwits, and additional species of, gull, of terns and noddies, and uh, birds called yagers, and gulls. The gators are polar uh, species. So this is our colea, and in the winter plumage, which you'll see now, if you get out on the lawns early enough in the morning, uh, is they call it golden because it's golden on the back here. And then in April, which is usually when I give this lecture, they're putting on their racing stripes because they're getting ready to race up to Alaska. And this is a male in breeding plumage. Uh, totally different. I've had lots of people call me up and tell me they've seen a brand new bird in April, and I'm almost always sure that it's going to be this one. Our colea in Hawaii breed in southeast Alaska, so Haines, Juneau. Uh, there are other uh, populations of colea that are farther south in the Pacific that breed up near Nome. Uh, and they're true to both sites. They're true to their winter sites. They come back to the same winter territory every year. And they breed in the same spot in their, on their breeding grounds. Uh, this is the bristle-thighed curlew. These breed up near Nome, although our birds in Hawaii don't breed there. Uh, I can't remember where they breed. And they winter. Uh, they winter as a few birds usually out in Kabuku, but they're also pretty common on Midway and some of the other northwestern Hawaiian islands. And although the bristle-thighed curlew doesn't make this migration, some of our accidental or regular migrants do. And this is the bar-tailed godwit. So the bar-tailed godwit breeds up here in uh, Alaska on the western coastline. And then it migrates without stopping all the way to New Zealand. And on its return trip to the breeding grounds, it goes up the east coast of Asia. That's a really long migration. And in Christchurch, New Zealand, when the bar-tailed godwits get there, they ring all the church bells because they're so happy about it. And, uh, I want us to be that happy about the colea coming back, even though they don't fly quite that far. Okay, so let's talk about our endemic birds, primarily land birds. Uh, we have a little flycatcher called the Elipio. Uh The palila, which is a very famous bird in uh, legal history, and that's too long a story for me to tell you now. Uh, the oma'o, which is a thrush, found only on the big island, and it's the only one of our thrushes that is not considered endangered or hasn't already gone extinct. And then most of you will know the state bird, the uh, nene, which is not flightless. It, it gets around really quite well. And it's doing very well on Kauai now. It's not doing quite so well on Maui or the big island. But we're learning a lot about its movements using radio tracking these days. Okay, fun fossil facts. I know this is all writing and not very interesting, but so we have at least 120 endemic species that have been described so far. And I think I should update this number, but I didn't know what to make it because I don't know how many new fossils have been described recently. Um, so the fossil uh, taxa that have been described are almost number 60 now. That's, that's a lot of birds that are known only as um, fossils or subfossils. And this is the total number of colonizations. So our avifauna, which has somewhere between 120 and 130 endemic species, is derived from about 20 different colonization events. And in some cases, there was not very much radiation. The heron is still just one species. Um, let's see. There, there were a couple of different kinds of hawks, but the hawks did not speciate. We just had two different species, one known only as a fossil. Um, we had a sea eagle, which is very closely related to our national bird, the bald eagle. Raven, we had one colonization of a raven, and we have four or five species, only one of which is still extant. And I could go on here, but um, the most remarkable radiation that we have is uh, includes the Hawaiian honey creepers, and I'm looking for 
whether or not they're in here. It should be one, maybe I left them out because they're so spectacular, but we had one colonization of a finch of some sort that radiated in into at least 56 different species. Okay, so bird families with endemic species, we've got two endemic shearwaters, one of them is still around, and we have one, um, two that are fossils, and one that is known to be extinct. Um, the other uh, shearwater, the other uh, Procellara that is extant is a petrel, our Hawaiian petrel, or Ua'u, and there are large colonies on Maui and on the island of Lanai. We had three species of ibises, and they were all flightless. There's the only flightless ibises in the world. And this painting, uh, which is an artist's conception of what the ibises might have looked like, this is what we, the artist thinks that the flightless ibis may have looked like. There's those tiny wings. And then the rails. Here's this very small rail and a bigger rail. We had 10, well, we had a total of 14 different rail species, and uh, Helen James, who's the principal paleontologist here, thinks that we're going to be finding more of them. Uh, in the Pacific, uh, in the different island groups in the Pacific, more than 2,000 species of rails have become extinct in the last 2,000 years. And that's more than 25% of all of the birds that exist in the world. So humans have had quite an impact. All these extinctions have happened post-human colonization. Um, and then we have to go, well, I'll show you the owls in a bit here. This is our Hawaiian hawk, only found on the big island now, but it did have a broader distribution. The Laysan rail, which went extinct during World War II. And uh, this is the pueo, or short-eared owl. So we have about 10 species of flightless geese and ducks, and they're, all of the flightless ones are extinct. And my good friend Doug Pratt painted this picture, and people asked him, well, how do you know it had a rust-colored cheek and a, you know, a red uh, waddle on the beak? And he said, well, how do you know it didn't? So that's what artists get to do. Lucky people that they are. Here's the, the uh, picture with the ibises and rails. These are three of the fossil species of ravens. We do call our extant raven a crow, but it really is more like a raven. And you have to be kind of a hair splitter to make a difference. But if you like ravens and crows, know that there's a very big difference behaviorally uh, in those uh, two groups of birds. Um, we have uh, some extant, two species of extant small ducks, the Laysan duck, which was recently translocated to Midway and is just going gangbusters. And we also have the Hawaiian duck, which still exists and is breeding very well in captivity and exists as a pretty intact species genetically on Kauai. But on this island, it has been so genetically swamped by hybridization from feral mallards. People buy mallards as pets, and then they release them mostly into Kauai Marsh, and they hybridize with, uh, with the kolea, which looks a little bit like this. And then Alaiula, the Hawaiian gallinule, is an endangered species. Probably 1,500 or 2,000 of these birds uh, still exist. And th this is a long-legged owl from the Midwest. Uh, these birds in the Midwest and in the West live in prairie dog colonies. They, they occupy abandoned burrows, and they eat prairie dogs, too. So I don't know why the prairie dogs tolerate them, but they do. We had four species of long-legged owls. And the interesting thing here is that they're long-legged, and long-legged owls are uh, very adept, not only at catching rodents, but at catching birds. And there weren't any small ground-dwelling mammals in Hawaii. So we think that's why we had a radiation of long-legged owls, because there were lots of small birds to prey on, but no small mammals except the ope opea, which is nocturnal. Here's the Hawaiian hawk. They come in a number of different color phases. This is a light color phase. Beautiful bird. Uh, I have a house in Volcano on the Big Island, and there's a couple that hang around there because my neighbor has really a lot of chickens. So I encourage him to keep feeding his chickens to keep the hawks coming around so I can see them and listen to them. Uh, Pueo is uh, not as common as it used to be. This bird nests on the ground, so it's highly susceptible to predation by mongooses, cats, and dogs. Okay, uh, more bird families with endemic species. Uh, corvids, crows, and ravens. There's one extant, but this bird is extant only in captivity. 
there are a little over 100 birds right now in breeding facilities on Maui and on the Big Island. And uh, it's going to be a huge political wrangle to figure out where we can start releasing them back into the wild. And I don't want to say too much more than that. We should have been doing this a long time ago, but we can't decide where to do it. And then when we do think of a good place to do it, we can't get going quickly enough to protect that habitat from destruction by feral uh, ungulates, deer, pigs, goats, and to uh, build predator-proof fences and keep cats and dogs out. <clears throat> okay, old world flycatchers. Uh, we have three species of um, flycatchers. We had, these are the solitaires of the thrushes. I think there were six solitaires. There are only two that are still extant. One is listed as endangered, and that's the small Kauai thrush on Kauai, six or 800 of them left. Um, and then old world warblers, my very favorite bird in the world, the Niwa Miller bird. This group, the Musicapids, has nine extant species, and then three forms that are extinct, and those are, um, those are all thrushes. Okay, so these used to be called the honey eaters, and now we call them the silky flycatchers. And there are so few species of silky flycatchers, I don't really expect anybody in here to, to be familiar with that, but it was a really big surprise. And what told us that, of course, was DNA, because they don't look anything like the birds that are in the Tylogonatidae family. And uh, this really set a lot of people on edge, people who don't like to see uh, species defined or relationships described using only molecules were pretty upset about this uh, because they see so much uh, similarity between our what we call honey eaters and uh, the Southwest Pacific honey eaters that they just can't believe it. And I have a hard time believing it myself, but I'm willing to believe in molecules. Okay, fragility. This is our Hawaiian honey creeper family. It is a subfamily that is endemic. There are 22 extant species 10 extinct, and when I say extinct, I mean historically extinct, so since 1778, and at least 24 that are known only as fossils. So the total number of endemic, oh, I guess it is 120. I think the 128 must be wrong. I'm going to have to go back over those numbers again. So you better not put numbers on the test, I guess. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, these are the silky flycatchers, or the OOs. If you know Hawaiian birds at all, you'll be familiar with that, uh, with the OOs. And the OOs are responsible for uh, providing yellow feathers that were used in Hawaiian feather artifacts. And tail feathers were also used, but that's a whole story in and of itself. I did some work on Hawaiian feather artifacts that tells interesting stories. Um, this is also uh, a silky flycatcher, just very different from these ovos, perhaps a separate colonization. These two birds, are, they're finches, right? Don't they look like finches to you? Is those bills? Anyway, these are Hawaiian honey creepers, and they are two of the, the 56 or so species that evolved from a single colonization by a finch. And then this is our Hawaiian raven, the alala, which exists only in captivity. Okay, some of the other representative species. We have three species of elapio, the Kauai elapio, the Oahu elapio, which I studied for my master's degree here, probably a couple of decades before many of you were born, but that's okay. Um, it's, the Oahu elapio is now listed as endangered. It's, it occurs in uh, very small numbers, maybe 500 in both the Waianae and the Ko'olau ranges. There's another species on the Big Island, this is the oma'o, which I mentioned before. This is a, a solitaire or a thrush found only on the Big Island. And this is the small Kauai thrush, the puaiohi. And it's different from all of the other thrushes and solitaires because it has pink legs. And it doesn't have much of a song, but it breathes like a rabbit in captivity. So it, the captive propagation program has been very successful. But then when the birds are released, they are not very wise about predators, and so birds that are released into the wild usually have a very uh, low survival rate and a low reproductive success rate. So that's something that we need to uh, work on. So this is a, um, a painting by my friend Doug Pratt illustrating some of the kinds of adaptations that Hawaiian honey creepers made. So our colonizing finch looked, well, probably this colorful, but anyway, this is what we think the uh, head and bill shape of the colonizer looked like. 
And we get things as, as outlandish as this bird, the Achaeopola owl. Notice that that lower mandible is straight and the upper mandible is curved. And so what they do with this, they use the lower mandible, like a woodpecker, to peck a hole into the bark of a tree or a shrub. And then they reach in with the upper flexible mandible and pull out the beetle grub. Uh, so we do have woodpeckers here in Hawaii. They just look a little bit different. And then there are quite a number of fish-billed species. Um, we have something called a parrot bill, found only on Maui. Um, this little bird is <clears throat> one of the more primitive species, and it just became extinct in 2004. I saw this bird for the first time, I think, in 1978. And then we had the group that's called the red and black birds, for obvious reasons. And most of those have long, curved bills and feed on nectar and uh, insects. Okay, so um, we're looking at the three different tribes the, uh, of uh, honey creepers. Let's see, Sidorostridae, these are not Sidorostridae, these are red and black birds here, the Akohe Kohe and the Apapane, but the finch-billed species, there were once 24 species, probably more, um, but we only had four that are left and that's Probably, it's probably really only three, the lace and finch, the nihoa finch, and the polila. We think that the ou has been gone for a while. Um, and the reason so many birds in this group are extinct is that they lived in the places people found uh, to be good places to live. And so people just replaced them. Um, and here are, here's a finch bill. That's the lace and finch. Here's one of the, they're called sickle bills, the anakuhi. And this is a typical red and black bird, the iidi. So these are the sickle bill birds, and they include the amakihi and then the Achaeopola owl, which I just showed you. Here's that really heavy, straight, lower mandible right there. 13 extant species. So these are doing better than either of the other two tribes of honey creepers. Um, and only six, only six fossil species, and only three even have gone extinct. So um, they're still doing pretty well. They are very versatile. This bird, the amakihi, can survive on nectar and insects as well, so it's got a diverse uh, diet. Now this bird was endemic to the Big Island, uh, and it has the largest, heaviest bill of any finch that's ever been described anywhere in the world. And there's a funny story behind the, the name. The, a newspaper reporter was describing this find in the Star Bulletin, and he got sort of exuberant about it and said, well, these paleontologists have found a finch with a huge bill, a, a King Kong bill. And so the paleontologist laughed at that and said, okay, well then I'm gonna call it the King Kong Finch. And so that's what it is, King Kong. So if you haven't seen the King Kong movie, you'll all wanna go out and do it now and you'll get an idea of what this bird must have been like, I think. Okay, the red and black birds. Um, there's some really interesting birds here, but I don't have time to talk about them all. This one's pretty cool. This is the Ula Ai Havani. Only five specimens were ever collected before it went extinct. Uh, and then there were a number of black or black and yellow birds. Those are all extinct. And then the ones that are extant include the Apapane, the Iidi, and the Akohikohi. All right, so here's a summary. Um, extant, about 42 endemic land birds, so about 35% of the species that were here before people got here are still around. The uh, historic periods, 1778 until now, um, 18 birds, and this is an underestimate. We know this is an underestimate but we're not really brave enough to say that yet. 15% of the species went extinct during the historic period. And then the birds that are known as fossils, which became extinct, and we do have documentation to show that they became extinct after human colonization, almost, well, half, half of the endemic land birds. And then there are very, the reason I put in the populations here is that, for example, the Oru had populations on Kauai, and on the big island, and I, I saw the bird on both islands, but it's long gone now. These are the birds that we're not ready to bring ourselves to say are extinct yet. The uh, kama'o, the large kawaii thrush, um, the olma'o, the molokai thrush, the kawaii o'o, the o'u, the kawaii akiloa, the nukupu'u, which occurred on several islands, the oahu alawahu, which is also called a creeper, the Kakavahie, the Molokai creeper, Maui Akepa, and the Pomohuli. And the ones with the red asterisks are birds that I have seen alive.
So if you don't think that makes me feel old, think of something else that will make me feel old. Besides the fact that I'm three times older than most of you. Anyway, I could be really depressed about that, but I'm trying not to let myself be that way. I'm just gloating that I got to see those birds before all the people who keep those long lists. Do. And I don't even keep a list. They just get so jealous. Okay, so that's a recap here. Uh, in 400 AD, so before human colonization, we had at least 120 endemic land birds. Um, half of them were still around by the time uh, people from continents got to Hawaii. Um, but all of the flightless geese and ducks, well, all of the flightless geese and ducks, you know, two rails were still around, but they went extinct during the historical period. And about a third of the small songbirds were extinct. Um, and there is a site on Maui that has a continuous 8,000 year record that tells us when these birds started to go extinct. And you can identify right when the people came because they brought rats and uh, uh, geckos with them. And when those show up, we know that the people were here. So in 2012 now, about we say now that about 42 still survive. But actually, those birds I showed you on the previous slide, those birds are probably all extinct. So that there were nine birds on that list. So it's probably a lot less than 42 still being around. So if we continue at this rate, they'll probably all be extinct before then. But let's not be too depressed about that. So what are the causes of decline and extinction? Well, the same stuff, if you haven't already heard about it, you're going to hear more about it, I'm sure, in this class. Um, it all relates to people. And let me just interject here that no matter where people go, continents, islands, whatever, they dramatically, they profoundly change their environment. But we have to keep in mind that those profound changes benefit people. And you know, we're only a little bit smarter than the rest of the animals. I think we're maybe quite a bit smarter than plants, but Kurt is sitting right here, so I don't know if I should really say that. So we make the habitat better for us, but at the same time, we make it much less suitable for other species. In a number of cases with the birds, especially the ground nesting birds like seabirds or the flightless birds, people ate those and probably ate them until there weren't any more to eat because there wasn't a whole lot of protein around in Hawaii except in the ocean when people first got here and in the form of birds. So, uh, and then we brought all sorts of grazing mammals and rooting mammals, pigs, goats, cattle, axis deer, um, black-tailed deer, you name it. Um, logging. Doesn't go on as much as it used to, but it still does. Agriculture, and that's for us, right? It's either for making food for us to eat or, in most of Hawaiian history, making food that made money, that was a cash crop, like sugar and pineapple. Uh, urbanization, we're just crowding out all those finches that lived along the shorelines. Now the tourists are all living there. Well, staying there. And, and some of us are too. Predation, disease, hunting, which doesn't really go on anymore, but it certainly did. Uh, up until about the 1930s, we were still going out there shooting nene and Hawaiian ducks and kolea and all that sort of thing. And then in the future, climate change is probably going to make a difference, primarily in the main Hawaiian Islands because the rainfall zones, the wet forest zones, are going to retreat up the mountain. But they're not going to, they're not going to grow higher. In other words, our tree line, which now is on some islands at 7,000 feet or 9,000 feet on another island, is going to remain at 9,000 feet, but the lower limits of the rainforest are going to get higher. So the suitable habitat for rainforest birds is going to go like this, and it's going to get a lot drier for us. So it's going to take a while for that to happen, but it's it's going to happen. So so let's just look at some examples here. Here's our favorite uh, uh, rainforest uh, undulate that we like to control. Uh, this is from Upper Hanami Forest on Maui, before pigs, after pigs. They, they're ground-dwelling things, so they, they root up ground-dwelling plants. And one thing that they do very frequently is to topple tree ferns. This is an old uh, tree fern that's been dumped over. So they took over the tree fern, and they rip it open, and they eat out the starch, because that's tasty. You know, potatoes, rice, got to have that with every meal. But what they leave behind is a, uh, a container that holds water really well. And mosquitoes can breed in that water. And the mosquitoes are probably the worst threat to the forest birds. Um, other kinds of ungulates that are causing problems are goats. 
Uh, years ago in the 70s, somebody built this exclosure to keep things out in, on the, in the lowlands of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And this goat is desperately trying to get in there and eat some of the plants that managed to survive and come up. And the fascinating thing about this particular exclosure is that this plant that you see here came up and was described as a new species. Nobody had seen it. None of them had been growing because the goats had suppressed the growth for so long. So the seeds that produced these plants had been in the seed bank for probably 150 years, maybe more. So it just goes to show you what happens when you take the damaging uh, element out. And uh, on um, Mauna Kea, uh, goats are also a problem, but sheep are a big problem on Mauna Kea. This is a photograph of Koho Olavi from the mid-1980s. Lots of goats on Koho Olavi, and then bless them, the Marines jumped up and said, we'll volunteer, we'll help you control the goats. So there haven't been goats on Koho Olavi for a long time, but you don't just recover from that in six months. So Koho Olavi is a, is a work in progress. Restoration there is going to take a very long time. And, uh, well, I don't want to talk about the sheep. If you want to talk about sheep, you can contact me later, because I get kind of mad when I talk about sheep. But they are eating the habitat of the endangered poila on the Big Island. And why we don't do something about that, I understand, but I certainly don't like. Um, logging is still an issue, and when I started working, uh, doing surveys of birds on the Big Island, this was a regular site in one of the area that I went to, areas that I went to count forest birds. Koa being taken out. So people come in, they log the koa, they sell it for whatever reason, and then they bring cattle in for grazing. So the koa never has a chance to come back. And so a lot of the areas, especially on the Big Island, that used to be koa forests or koa ohia mixed forests are, uh, are still uh, grazing land for cattle. And there are lots of feral cattle out there, too, on the Big Island. Um, that's another story. So we end up with something that looks like this or something that looks like that. Um, people are now interested in growing koa commercially, and that's taking a lot of the pressure off of logging. So that's a really good development. Okay, agriculture, um, of course, uh, displaced a lot of plants and animals, and here's some sugar cane, and gosh, what's this? Well, there's some open space there, but I don't think we would find very many native birds at the ROI golf course. Well, we would find some colea there, so that would be good. Um, all right, predators, feral cats. You can't really tell from this photograph, but this cat has killed a laysan albatross, which probably weighs more than the cat does, and is feeding on it. And this is taken on Guadalupe Island off of Baja, California. And here is a small Indian mongoose with an apapane. Rats are very effective predators of small birds. They can climb up into the trees and kill females incubating eggs or take eggs or take nestlings. Uh, and then there's disease. And our two most serious diseases are carried or vectored by mosquitoes that breed, for example, in the trunks of hollowed out tree, tree ferns, but also in any kind of accumulation of water. The mosquito that carries this, uh, these two diseases is the same one that carries the cat and dog heartworm. And I, back when I taught 100 level courses very long ago, there was a student in one of my labs that wanted to see if a mosquito could breed in one drop of water, or if the larva could develop. And he actually had one larva that did survive and develop into a, an adult mosquito in one drop of water. So getting rid of mosquitoes is a pretty big battle. And uh, wherever there are no mosquitoes, the forest birds are still doing pretty well. And in some places, like Oahu, some of the birds, like the Oahu Amuhi, seem to be developing resistance or tolerance of at least avian malaria. So those are good things, too. And if people always want to know, well, what about uh, construction of feathered artifacts by Hawaiians? Well, pre-contact artifacts, I, I have to say, they cannot have made a very big contribution to reducing populations of forest birds. Because the, the birds, for example, that provided these red feathers are treetop dwellers. You don't have a gun. You don't have much of a net. All you have is maybe some sticky breadfruit gum that you wipe on the branches, and, and then you wait until an eevee comes down and gets stuck on that. You're not going to decimate populations catching birds like that. And I actually have done work. Um, well, I've had students come to feathers, of course, in uh, Hawaiian feather artifacts. 
And uh, sure, lots of birds were killed, but not nearly as many as were killed later with shotguns or whose habitat was altered by agriculture, urbanization, grazing mammals who were eaten by cats and rats and mongooses. So there was a bit of a dent here, but I really don't think that the construction of feather artifacts contributed to, certainly to any bird species extinctions. Now here I have to say something. Most of these feathers, the long ones, are red-tailed and white-tailed tropic bird feathers that have been split in half on the longitudinal axis. And they curl when they do that, so they look kind of pretty. So that's a really cool uh, uh, feather cane. But I think this one is in the Bishop Museum. Now, after people from continents got here, Hawaiians liked to give them feather artifacts because they were extremely valuable and precious to Hawaiians. And the artifacts totally changed in their composition. They became much bigger. They required a lot more feathers. People were given guns to kill birds. I still think that this, this was not, not a form of population control that had even a, 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 well, I know, a very small fraction of the kind of impact that land clearing, predators, disease, those things are much more important. So you can't convince me, and I've counted a lot of feathers on a lot of uh, Hawaiian feather artifacts, that this was a cause of bird extinction. So <clears throat> uh, things are not getting a whole lot better. We're trying awfully hard, but it takes people a long time to get through process. And, and what holds us up today, I think, in Hawaiian bird conservation primarily is people and politics. If you're interested in conservation biology folks, folks, go take some conflict resolution courses, learn about how to deal with people because 98% of the problems are people getting together, deciding what to do. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. And in these, I think, are our two worst nightmares, the brown tree snake and West Nile virus because those are surely going to wipe the birds out. Um, Axis deer have been introduced illegally to the Big Island, so I'm, I'm rooting for biological control. We can get one of those ones that's like in the life of pie, and it wouldn't kill us if it just killed the deer. I think that would be, I think we should look into that. Um, and uh, with this bird, we could have saved it. We didn't act soon enough, but I want to leave you with a positive thought. This little bird, which I decided I wanted to study when I was 19, and finally got around to doing when I was 35, has in the last two years been taken 50 birds have been taken from the island of Nihoa to the island of Lake Span on a boat. They do remarkably well on a boat. And they were released on Lake Span. Uh, 2011, we took 24. 2012, 26. Now there are at least 75. That is superb. It's, it's only been a year and a half, and they've already increased their population size by 50%. So some of these birds, we can do something proud. And I'm glad that it's my favorite bird we can say that about. This must be the end. Thank God. I'm overcome. Thank you.